Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. I'm Aditi from ISWA and I'm moderating today's webinar on the benefits of compost and anaerobic digestate when applied to soils. Thank you so much for connecting with us from around the world. Almost 300 people registered for this webinar, which is excellent considering that this is such a niche and specialized topic. We will be joined today by two experts on biological treatment, the chair and the vice chair of our working group on biological treatment of waste. And they will present some of the results of the study that we've been carrying out over the past 18 months. Through our study, we've been, we've been finding out that globally approximately 2.6 million tons of organic waste is generated as municipal solid waste every day. That total is just under a billion tons a year. And due to increasing urbanization and improving live, living conditions, it is projected that this amount is expected to reach 4.5 million tons a day by 2050. This organic waste is made up of food and garden waste and can easily be recycled through composting and anaerobic digestion. These are techniques that have been proven and are very well established in several countries around the world. So this webinar is going to describe some of the physiochemical properties of soil and outline the important role that it plays in providing a medium for humans to grow food. Notably, soil organic matter is an important reservoir of carbon, storing more than the atmosphere and terrestrial vegetation combined. However, this finite resource is currently under threat due to erosion, nutrient depletion and pollution. And the FAO has recently suggested that about one third of soil globally is moderately to highly degraded. So in a world of increasing population and changes in climate, this has the potential to undermine humans' ability to grow and harvest food sustainably. So this webinar, uh, we're going to summarize the recent work carried out by ISWA on the benefits of compost and anaerobic digestate when applied to soil and its potential to help combat desertification. The, the brief presentation is going to be followed by a question and answer session and all participants are encouraged to type their questions in the questions window, which is on the right, of, right hand side of your screen. And we will choose a few of these questions that will be answered by the speakers at the end. So before I actually hand over to our speakers, I'd like to very briefly uh, thank our sponsors. They are Veolia, the city of Rotterdam, Ecomondo, and Messi Munich. These are our main sponsors and we are very grateful for their support. Thanks are also going out to our platinum members uh, and the, the, the generosity of our sponsors. It would be hard to do what we do without their support. For instance, we are bringing this webinar to you for free and we count on the support of all our members. So if you're not yet a member, please take a moment by visiting our membership page. The link is on the screen. You could also reach out to our membership manager, Mr. Daniel Purchase, by writing to him at dpurchase.org. We have several membership options, very flexible ones, with discounts for students and with uh, discounts for low-income countries and for online members and so on. And we are also planning to do several webinars in the future for members only, so please do join us for those as well. So before we move on, I'd like to take a brief moment here to introduce ISWA, as several of you joining today are not yet members. The International Solid Waste Association is a global independent and non-profit making association. We work in the public interest and we are the only worldwide association that promotes comprehensive and prof professional waste management, also a transition to a circular economy. We are currently open to individuals and organizations and members from the scientific community, public institutions and public and private companies from all around the world that are working in the field of waste management or are interested in waste management. We are the only worldwide association that enables its members to network with professionals, with companies and institutional representatives from all around the world. Our mission is to promote and develop sustainable and professional waste management worldwide. Uh, we currently have members from over 100 countries and this number is increasing uh, per day. Two of these members here are present with us today as speakers. And so I'd like to give the floor now to the speakers of today's webinar, uh, Jane Gilbert and Marco Ritchie Jurgensen. I would like to invite them on stage and also to briefly introduce themselves by saying their names, their roles within ISWA and where they're located currently. I'll just give them a second to join and come on stage. Take yeah. a second. Okay, hi, I'm in. Hi, I'm in. Hi. And, yes. um, yeah, hello everybody. I'm Jane Gilbert, I'm from the UK. 
I've been involved in biological treatment for about the past, past 25 years. My background is in microbiology and biochemistry and I've been involved in this study with uh, Marco under DT um, as part of our working group. I'm currently the vice chair of our biological treatment working group so if that's of interest to you and you are an ISWA member then please um, contact the ISWA secretariat because the more people we can have the more um, brains and um, expertise we've got to uh, contribute to the debates. Thank you, Tim. Marco? Well, good afternoon. I'm talking to you from Verona, northern Italy. Uh, I'm working for the Italian campus in Umbaga as an organization and as Jane, I'm involved in almost 25 years now in promoting separate collection of organic waste and recycling through composting and production of biogas. Uh, I'm really happy to have such a large group of experts and people being interested in this topic. Today we're talking about benefits of compost and digested when applied to soil in this webinar. And of course, we are looking forward to have some of you being active members of our working group after the webinar. So if you like it, join us. This is the message. Thank you so much, both of you. The floor is now yours. Today we're going to focus on the um, most important topic of this ISVA investigation, which our working group has carried out in about 18 months, which are the benefits of compost and digested when applied to soil. Uh, we decided to split this activity into uh, basically four reports, uh, trying to give uh, clear answers to some fundamental questions. Uh, first of all, um, as I said, they, it, it took some time to, to take, to rule out this activity and, uh, okay, now it works. And uh, you will be able to download the first three reports from the ISWA website uh, um, um, on real time, as long as you have been registered and logged in into our website. Um, briefly summarizing, the project deliverables are four. The first one is focusing on the global arising of organic waste uh, worldwide. So it was a tentative assessment. The second document, which is the one we are focusing today, is talking about the benefits of compost and digested when applied to soil. So it's going more deeply into how soil works in connection with this material. Uh, and for the next webinars, we will focus more in detail about the situation of soils in five countries. And then uh, on the final report, which is trying to do an assessment about the benefits in uh, uh, numerical and economical terms. Why uh, are we talking about organic waste? Well, there are a basic of reasons for doing this. First of all, we know that when talking about organic waste, we have a variety of sources uh, which uh, can be mainly from municipal origin, at least from the assessment we have presented on our last webinar, we were mainly focusing on organic waste sources from municipalities. So not from manures or not from any sources which are out, let's say, of the boundaries of a city or of a municipality. We also know that uh, uncontrolled disposal of municipal solid waste, which includes high amounts of organic waste, is the main cause of uh, uh, negative emissions uh, to air and to soil and so to water from waste management, which means methane emission into air, black, black carbon if you're going to burn this waste, and of course others, pathogens and liquid leachate. Uh, just to wrap up about what we said about uh, report one, report one is focusing on the role that uh, municipal solid waste management can play in diverting significant amounts of organic waste from disposal towards becoming feed for, feedstock for recycling. By recycling, we always mean in these four reports, quality composting and uh, production of, anaerobic, uh, of biogas by means of anaerobic digestion. We have, shown that in a number of reports it is almost demonstrated that cities have a significant role to play on average more than 50 percent of the waste arising of a city are organic waste so uh, the second topic of our investigation is soil and why are we talking about soil well for the simple reason it, it is uh, sometimes an unknown argument at least to waste experts uh we know that in that there is a threat to our soils globally at the global level 
And uh, uh, we know that some data which are available show that in the last 40, 50 years, about 30% of the world's soil or cropland has become unproductive. And it is obvious that this trend cannot be sustainable if you connect it with an increasing world population. So uh, we know that soil is also the source of our food and hence the long-term sustainability of fertile soil is a prerequisite for the sustainability on food production on Earth. Um, we also know that uh, soil is a significant store for uh, carbon and so a continuous loss of carbon from soil, from organic carbon, is of course uh, having a significant greenhouse gas effects. Um, we know that soil is under threat, under threat, and if you want to go into the details about these threats, just uh, dig into the report we are presenting today. I'm not going into detail now, but just to try to link what uh, consistent management of organic waste can do in connection of producing uh, organic matter which can be brought back to soil. In report one, we tried to quantify or to estimate theoretically how much compost could be produced if we would be able to transform uh, most of the organic waste produced by urban environments worldwide into compost. And what comes out by these key numbers uh, is that uh, roughly speaking we have a potential to generate or to produce something like 300 million tons per annum of compost. And uh, just to link it to the agricultural soil available worldwide, we know that with this compost, we would be able to restore soil fertility in between two up to 4% of the global agricultural soil. Again, these numbers, uh, tentative assessments, which show how precious compost or digested can be, and so how fundamental it is that cities and decision makers start today to take consistent decision in from diverting organic waste from disposal, controlled or uncontrolled disposal, towards recycling. And to better understand what the effects are of compost and digested uh, in connection with its interaction with soils, I'm handing over to my colleague Jane Gilbert and uh, she's going to present the main contents of uh, the second of our four reports of this investigation. I will be back later for your questions at the end of the webinar. Thank you very much for joining. Okay, thanks Marco. Um, that's a good introduction, so hopefully that set the context. But what we wanted to do with our working group on biological treatment was to look really at, well, what are the benefits? Because we often talk about treating organic waste, as Marco has said, is in um, negating the bad effects that can happen from uncontrolled dumping of bio waste, organic waste. But what we really wanted to do within this was look at the benefits that can be realized and not just looking at the benefits to crops which is where most of the studies apply to but really looking at the soil under which these um, into which these crops are growing so we carried out a very comprehensive literature review during late 2018 2019 and we really tried to base our literature review on peer-reviewed scientific papers, so those that have been quality checked already, or those that have been specifically um, published by um, governmental bodies, such as the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, which has done some wonderful work on soils over the last few years. We then tried to group it down and look at the effects of compost um, and anaerobic digestate in soil, looking at some of the physical, the chemical, and the biological effects. But I think if we're going to start looking at the effects of compost and digestate, it's really important that we consider two factors. One is the composition of these materials, um, of the organic waste, and one is the 
process through which they are transformed and used and as a microbiologist by background of course it's the microorganisms that are of huge interest to me and the ways in which they do things now very briefly organic weights can be broken down down into a number of constituent parts oh, we've got lignin at the top and that's the hard woody structural material in wood and it is very degraded very slowly and it does need oxygen so it's not a very good um, feedstock for anaerobic processes. Cellulose and hemicellulose as well, they're the power sources. They're, the, they're, they're what really um, powers the two systems. They're polymers of glucose and other sugars. So they, they give the bacteria and the fungi that are in there the energy that they need to do their work. Proteins are nitrogen rich and providing those. And there are other carbohydrates such as um, sugars, polysaccharides, and also fats and oils as well. So they're the broad groups of organic waste. And of course, they're variable in different amounts. In terms of the microorganisms, well, it's really the bacteria and the fungi that are involved in both processes. The bacteria can either be aerobic, which means that they need oxygen to survive, or they can be anaerobic, very, very broadly speaking, which means that they can do their work and that they can um, they, they can metabolize um, some of these organic wastes without there being any oxygen present. The actinomycetes are a group of bacteria, so they're not separate bacteria, they're a group of them, but they're really important in the composting process and in, the, in particular in the um, degradation of lignins as well. Fungi are multicellular organisms and cellularly they're much more um, similar to ourselves, but they're really, really important in the degradation of organic waste and in particular the lignins as well. Temperatures, we can either have them at a medium temperature or a high temperature, mesophilic or thermophilic. So the, the, the types of different microorganisms that are involved in transforming organic wastes are actually immense. They interact in very complex ways, which uh, microbiologists are only just starting to understand. And some of them create certain byproducts, which the other ones will then use as food sources to metabolize. So it's a very complicated pr process, but it's worth bearing that in mind when we're thinking about the effects that um, these have on soils. One of the most important transformations that occurs, occurs um, in the composting process, where we have the lignins, the cellulose, the hemicelluloses, and some of the proteins, and that these are transformed through to what we call humic substances, which are the fulvic acids, the humic acids, and humin. And the fulvic acids are generally a bit more labile. They're broken down a lot easier. They're broken down to humic acids and then also to humin as well, which is the really stable material. But they're groups of substances. They're not just single ones. And I found this little flow diagram the other day on the right hand side. And that just shows some of the complexity involved and the little um, blue, blue, um, rectangle around it is really what happens during the composting process. So a lot of interaction between different molecules, different microorganisms, but forming these humic substances. During the composting process from the literature that we looked at, we could see that by and large where researchers had looked at the extent of humification, it generally increased during the process. And this, this depends upon, obviously upon the feedstocks, but by and large, where well, we have lignin material there, so woody wastes going in, they are transformed. And this is just shown the humification index, which is a ratio of the fulvic acids to humic acids as a percentage of the total carbon. So it's, this isn't just a relative increase, it's an absolute increase as well. But these humic substances, the important things is that they are precursors for stable carbon in the soil. So that's worth bearing that in mind when we're thinking about the materials going on to soil. Anaerobic digestion, of course, is a very different process. And I've put down the three main stages here, which I'm, I'm guessing that you are all aware of. Um, it generally tends to deal with simpler carbon substrates going in. So we're talking about food waste, mostly manures, um, commercial industrial waste that tend to have the simpler sugars, starches and proteins in there. 
Um, the anaerobic process obviously doesn't involve oxygen, so there's very few fungi involved, mostly bacteria that we thought to be involved in the um, commercial AD. And the fact that you've got simpler carbon compounds coming in means that they're converted more easily to methane and carbon dioxide. And the main benefit of these transformations is, of course, methane as, um, as an energy source. When we looked through the literature, the, I think one of the key things was that we found little or no evidence of humification during the process. One of the papers suggested that there was limited humification, but then that was all broken down further on along in the process. So we're talking about two very different processes, but also the processes that treat different types of feedstocks as well. Adding these organic amendments, adding compost and digestate to soil really involves three stages of decomposition. And I've summarised here a little um, flow diagram on the left hand side of the screen that has been used in, um, in a carbon modelling programme over by the US Department of Agriculture. And they've basically classed three phases of decomposition. One where the organic materials decompose very quickly, that's phase one. Ones where they are decomposed a little bit slower, which is phase two, and then they transform some of those into phase three materials that can um, have very, very low rates of degradation. And in this model, they've based it on cumulative uh, degree days, which is basically the temperature in or the temperature in degrees Celsius times by the number of days. So it just gives you a feel of temperature and time as well. But what we find is that by and large, the digestate, anaerobic digestate, because of the materials going in, uh, are basically in this phase one, they're rapidly decomposed. Whereas with compost, we're looking at for a little bit of phase one, some of them from phase two, but then then being transformed in the soil into phase three organic matter as well that's been brought down. So it's important to bear that in mind. When we're looking at the benefits of organic matter, well, we, we, we've set them out quite clearly in the report, but it's the organic soil, organic carbon content. And as Marco said, there's a sequestration potential there, which we were going to deal with in the next report, in, the, in report four of this series. There's also a water holding capacity um, benefit, and I'm coming and talk about these in a minute, benefits on soil structure, improving nutrient retention capacity, the cation exchange capacity, and last but it's certainly not least, increasing the um, biomass and the um, activity of the microbes that, that are in the soil. As I said, we've the compost and digestates both because of the nature of the feedstocks that are used during the processes and the process itself, they can be classed in different ways. And we came across a very neat paper that had been um, authored by um, a number of European colleagues, but led by Adri Viken over in the Netherlands. And what they did was they looked at the e effective organic matter, the EOM, as a ratio of that to phosphate and to mineral nitrogen. And the EOM is basically the long-term carbon and the carbon that will stay in soil for over a year. And they looked at a number of different materials, including digestate, slurries, animal manures and composts. And as far as we're concerned for anaerobic digestate, the organic, the, the um, digestate can really be better classed as an organic fertilizer because it has a low ratio of um, effective organic matter to nutrients, which means there's relatively more nutrients to the organic matter. Whereas with compost, it's the other way around. The organic matter is more predominant than the, the nutrients. So I, I really like this. I, I like matrices anyhow. They put things very simply. So I, I just this is a very important way of being able to summarize the different types of um, materials that we're going to be putting onto soil. So let's just have a look at some of the results that we found from actually looking at the benefits of applying compost to soils. And one of the most important is the increases in the soil organic carbon levels. Now, of course, we've got different types of organic carbon, some that are 
more easily turned over these um, these phase one um, substances, but also those that stay there for much longer. So those humic substances that are formed from the lignins during the composting process. And we summarised in the report, which you might well have seen, some tables with different um, studies summarised. But just for very briefly, just to say that some overall, as a, as a very broad brush summary, that studies of between four and 12 years suggested that between 11 and 45% of the organic carbon in the compost remained a soil organic carbon at the end of the experiments. So that's quite significant. How much of that is really long term, the more stable materials um, is, is um, something we need to dig down into a bit more. But importantly, what they do feel is that based upon a paper by Polson, um, where they've aggregated data from other studies and looked at very long term studies, they suggested that somewhere between 50 and 70 kilograms of of organic carbon in dry compost per ton will actually be sequestered in the soil. So this is not the total organic matter or the total organic carbon. This is what is thought to go into the long term carbon pool in soils. And we've benchmarked this against some other studies and it, 70 is round about the one that the VHE, the Hummus Organization in, um, in Germany use as well. And it's in the right ballpark figure with a number of different um, number of different um, authors. So we have potential carbon sequestration there. And I've summarized some data just on the um, right hand side in these little graphs. And what this is just I realize the um, figures might be a little a little small to read, but this is just the difference in soil organic carbon um, relative to the control measured over 14 years of compost addition. And the important thing to see here is that the greatest increase is actually seen further down in the soil horizon. In this case, this is the 15 to 30 centimetre soil horizon rather than at the top. And there is good evidence as well from another paper published last year by Totka's, I'm not entirely sure if that's um, pronounced correctly, where they actually found that most of the um, benefits were actually found in the 30 to 2 metre horizon. So there's something going on that seems to be putting this organic carbon much further down in the soil, which is great um, from a point of view of um, soil sequestration and long term benefits. I think what we need to stress as well, and this stress, and this has been um, stressed by other um, authors, is that the benefits of applying organic matter to soils that are degraded and low in organic matter don't carry on infinitely. It's not a straight line graph where you see year on year increases in soil organic carbon. You will see that round about the first 20 years or so of putting on annual applications of compost, but then the rate of sequestration and the rate at which that organic carbon starts to increase starts to slow down until a new equilibrium is reached. And that's an important thing to, to bear in mind when we consider long-term strategies. But the important thing is as well, if this soil is actually being used to grow crops on, um, so it's being used for arable crops or vegetables or horticultural crops, if you don't keep on adding the organic carbon to it, the levels will start to drop again. So we need to just bear that in mind about getting soils back up to decent organic carbon levels, but also maintaining them as well. So hopefully that's shown that in, the, in that little graph. Some of the the other benefits, which are much more qualitative um, rather than quantitative, is about improving soil aggregation. So this is about the size of the aggregates in the soil, which will affect the soil stability, its physical form, reducing its bulk density so it's easier for crops to grow in. It also helps improve the rate at which it can actually hold on to water because there's more soil pores in there. So it's, much, much better, it's a much more resilient soil increases in water holding capacity and fortunately the scientific literature on that is not as strong as we would have liked. We were lucky in doing the work that there had been a meta study published I think in about 2018 that actually summarized about 80 or 90 different studies. So we used the summary um, figures that they had um, 
that the authors in that meta study had used because basically they did the job for us. So I think there's still a lot more work to do looking at um, increasing water holding capacity and whether some of that is due to the organic carbon or just because of improvement in soil aggregation and the physical properties of the soil. Of course, coming back to my um, to my petal of increasing soil biodiversity, the microbes in there, there's been increases in enzymes associated, extracellular enzymes associated with soil microbial nutrient um, turnover, increases in enzyme activity, microbial biomass, increases in earthworms as well that will live on some of the decaying organic matter and the um, and the bacteria and fungi and the, um, the, the the nematodes and that that are actually in the soil. So um, we've seen a whole increase in the soil food web within the soil as well. And there's obviously evidence as well um, that um, some significant soil bond pathogens can be reduced or suppressed by some of the green waste compost. And once again, it's, it's thought that the lignins there, the lignin precursors have some effect. In terms of soil fertility, well, there's been a huge, huge number of studies, both for anaerobic digestation and, of course, compost, looking at increase, improving fertility of soils, looking at nutrients going on onto soils, and also looking at crops, increases in crops, um, crop yields, different types, different rotations, etc. I think the important thing to bear in mind for compost is that a lot of the nitrogen is complexed in the matrix, in these organic um, compounds, as organic nitrogen and is not directly available to the crops in the first year of application for the crops to, to grow on. Now, that in itself isn't a bad thing because what it's doing is it's increasing the activity and it's increasing the amount of nitrogen in the soil over the long term. So it's not just all there to be washed out when it rains heavily and it's not there directly for the plants to uptake them in the first year after application. There's a long, slow release. And finally, but last but not least, soil buffering. A lot of composts tend to be slightly alkaline, so there's a liming effect there. It can help um, in reduce acidity in, in agricultural soils. And also the matrix as well, actually in the compost, can increase the cation exchange capacity within the soil. So helping the soil to bind onto some of the big plant macronutrients, calcium, magnesium, and so forth. Some of the... Um, um, some of the um, cations that are in there so um you know once again it, it's helping buffer so all round um multiple effects lots of them have been known for a long time but um we wanted to really look at that and look at the um, latest scientific evidence to sue to to uphold that and i just wanted to put on this little graph here you've seen the green lines before in this um looking at changes in soil organic matter but the blue lines here are also showing changes in, pardon me, in total soil nitrogen as well over this 14 year period relative to the control. So we can see that we are actually building up a bank, a pool of these nutrients in the soil as well, which is there not only for the plants, but for all the good little organisms that are in there to feed on as well. When it came to digest state, there's been a huge amount of work um, published looking at effects on crop growth, crop yield and short term effects on the plants and crops themselves. And digest state, as we've said before, is a great biofertilizer, lots of nutrients in it, and it has a very important role to play there in offsetting some of the inorganic um, fertilizers. The effects on soil over the, over the longer term, so over a year, are less well defined. And that's probably due to the fact that AD um, hasn't really been used as a technique for organic wastes on a large scale. It's certainly been used for a long time on small scales, but um, not as much as it has been for compost when looking at um, agricultural and horticultural um, improvements. So the effects of digestate are tended to be short term. 
Some of the papers we looked at showed a reduction in soil density, but then we looked at another study from the UK, which perhaps suggested that um, the digestates resulted in soil compaction. And I think we can probably work it out because the feedstocks going in don't tend to have a lot of these big structural um, macromolecules in there. So they're not going to behave in the, in the same way with the soil microbes and with the soil um, physical um, properties of the soil in the same way the composts do. There were some studies to showed increase in aggregate stability and also moisture retention, but they tended to be short term studies. Of course, because there's a lot of nutrients in there, the soil microbes love it because you're giving them lots of food and increasing their activity and their numbers as well. But once again, relatively short term lived and once it's been used up, the food source has been used up, they go back down. And there was also a study in the UK that suggested that some of the earthworm numbers decreased. Unsure really why it was thought it might have been due to volatile fatty acids. So really the benefits of digestate derive from the, their potential as a biofertilizer, as a renewable fertilizer, rather than as a soil conditioner, which is what we'd shown earlier on as well. Because primarily the feedstocks are different, then compost we're not having the lignins the woods so there's any very few if any humic precursors there especially if it's food waste let's face it we don't eat wood so you know we, know we don't put it in our digesters and the process is clearly optimized to generate methane because that's where its um, main strength is rather than keeping onto the carbon to go onto the soil so really to conclude these two last um, slides from this work and this report, this report too, is <clears throat> I think the, the degradation, the biodegradation of organic waste through either composting or anaerobic digestion is extremely complex. I do think there's an awful lot more research that, um, that could be carried out on that. Um, the process clearly dictates the type of feedstocks that can be used in the process and the way in which they behave um, when they come out at the end, whether, <coughs> excuse me, whether or not it is an aerobic or an anaerobic process. But really, what I think the key message that we want to get across through this work is that compost is best described as an organic soil improver, whilst the digestate is best described as an organic fertilizer or a biofertilizer. just looking very specifically at compost we know that it can confirm long-term benefits to soils so increasing soil organic carbon levels which is so important from a soil productivity level but also from a carbon sequestration potential as well and report four which is currently with the designers will be presenting some calculations using some of the data from this study to actually see well how can we actually quantify some of these benefits the compost as well can build up a nutrient bank. It's that long term uh, nutrients in there that are mineralized slowly. So helping feed both plants and the microbes and the other organisms within that soil food web. Improving soil structure, which is so important um, as we are having different changes in our climate. Um, so it's improving the resilience of the soil improving its buffering capacity and its ability to hold on to nutrients, which is important. Reducing acidification because it has some liming potential. And of course, last but not least, include increasing soil biodiversity and microbial activity, which is so important for healthy, productive soils. So there's some a, another, a few initiatives. We're going to have another webinar in July. Um, talking about soils from five different um, countries and then <coughs> excuse me the um, another webinar in August um, <coughs> excuse me it's not coronavirus honest um, I've done too much talk is my throat telling me to shut up um, so we'll have another one in August where we'll be actually presenting some of these um, um, ca calculations and of course, last but not least, please have a look at the SOS Save Organics in Soil um, initiative, which has been set up by the European Compost e Network, ECN, and also in partnership with the um, um, with Cheek, the um, Compost and Biogas um, Association in Italy. So two other things that we're hoping this work will actually mesh into. 
So if I can pass over now to my colleagues and I will um, turn, turn myself back onto mute. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank you so much, Marco, for such an excellent pre presentation. I'm actually going to give Jane a moment to drink some water. Yeah. Because I do true. have a few, I do have a few questions that have come up over the weeks. And also we've been receiving very interesting questions over the chat box. We will get to some of those in, in a few minutes. Uh, but before we go on to those that came in from the chat box, I'd like to go back to Jane because, you know, you've given us such a good, good overview of, of, of the activity that takes place in soils and how important it is from a carbon sequestration perspective as well. Um, what we see around the world is that composting and anaerobic digestion are mainly carried out as mutually exclusive processes. So Jane, can you suggest a few first steps that municipalities and cities can take to properly manage their bio stream? And do you recommend that they begin with composting or producing digestate? Uh, this would also actually cover a few of the questions that we've received online. Okay, thanks, Aditi. I mean, that's a, it's, a, it's a complex question. Um, I, I think what I would start with for any municipality looking to think about how they will manage their organic waste, the first thing you need to do is characterize it. Get an understanding of what is being produced, where it's being produced, how much are the seasonal effects. Um, so do that characterization have an understanding of what where how and when it's being produced because that will then start to dictate how you can then look further down i think what the other thing you need to be looking at very much is well if you are going to collect it and we do need to stress that we're talking about separate collection here not mixed residual um, waste as part of a mixed municipal waste stream because quality is so important um, but look at where you could potentially be processing this material so is there any existing infrastructure is there any other existing waste infrastructure that you could annex a production process onto um, but also looking very closely and thinking right from the very very beginning where is the outputs from this going to be going are we going to be putting this back trying to sell this back to locals or are we going to be looking to putting this back onto agriculture and horticultural land so the soil receptor which tends to be often overlooked when municipalities do set up these um set up um their collection and treatment systems look at that very very carefully in terms of should it be compost or anaerobic digestion? I think once again, that's very much up to the municipality to decide what is the imperative? What is the type of feedstock? If you're going to be having a lot of woody waste coming through, well, you're probably going to be better off looking at a composting plant. If there's a need for energy and you're going to have a lot of food waste, well, look at trying to, to do that. But I think the important thing is to bear in mind that these two processes should not be mutually exclusive. Um, composting is far simpler to set up, it's far simpler to run, it's a more robust um, process. Com um, anaerobic digestion requires a lot more capital infrastructure investment and also technical competence to run that as well. But very much think if you are going to be going down the route of doing some AD, think about composting, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the digestate afterwards, putting it through a stabilization process for what's left after you've harvested the energy, because that's where the real benefits to soil are going to be. So yes, yeah, some quite complicated things there, but um, no, no one size fits all, but make sure you certainly do your homework in types of characterizing your wastes, where you can produce it, where you can treat it, and what most importantly as well, where that's going to go. Thank you very much. Uh, so this brings me to a question now towards Marco. And again, this is going to answer a few questions that have risen through the chat box themselves. Um, Marco, how important is it to stress that, that the benefits can only be realized if the compost and digestate is of high quality, which, you know, meaning that organic waste must be separately collected and is not contaminated, something that Jane has also referred to. You've said a lot as well. Well, um... Thank you for that question, Aditi. It is so important that probably we forgot to stress it at the beginning of this webinar. 
And to those who didn't participate in the former event, have a look at the previous webinar. Uh, when Jane was showing the audience the benefits on compost and digested on soil, it was always implicit that we are talking about high quality feedstock. And so separate collection is a must. There were some questions during our presentation in the chat regarding mm -hmm. compost from MBT facilities from mechanical sorting. Uh, for us, it's fundamental. 30 years and more of separate collection and composting have shown, at least in Europe, that uh, a good supply chain for having feedstock for composting and anaerobic digestion starts at the location of the waste producer, which means households and commercial activities. Uh, without that, we would be unable to uh, prevent physical contamination, which means plastics, glass, metals, and heavy metals to get into the feedstock and so they could end up into the compost or into the digestate. So it's fundamental. Without that, I would say that all the benefits we are talking about today will probably be hindered. So it has been always a prerequisite and it's clearly stated in all our reports that we're start talking of feedstock which are collected separately at source. Right. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Marco, that was very helpful, and I hope it clarifies a few questions that came to us via the chat. Um, I would pivot now to Jane, and it's going back again to about safety and use. So, do you think renewable fertilizers are actually safe to use? And do you see for you know do you see any challenges uh, about using digestate on soils, Jane? Yeah. Well, when you talk about safety, Aditi, I guess you're talking about environmental safety. So safety to the environment and also to the ecosystems into which they're applied. And I think Marco has very clearly set out um, the, the issue about quality and reducing and minimising contamination as far as it is practically possible. Um, because the, the issue here is we're talking about long term application. So what we don't want to see is any um, increase in um, potential contaminants in soil that accumulate over time. Um, in terms of application, any fertilizer has to be applied at the right time and at the right rate. And if that's being used for grain crops, then the farmer needs to understand what their soil type is, what the climate is like, when their crops are going to need it. If you put fertilizers on any soil when they're not needed, that's when there's going to be surplus of nutrients that um, are not going to be helpful. Um, I think in terms of quality there's um, and safety, in Europe we have the EU nitrates directive which limits the amount of fertilisers that can be put on to reduce the amount of nitrates that are being released into um, surface and groundwaters. So we're limited by nitrogen um, on a, either a one year or a three year rotation. Also, phosphorus in some parts of Europe as well is rate limiting, That especially when there are a lot of animals grazed on it, there can be a lot of phosphorus. So it's all about safety comes about using quality materials, putting them on in the right, right rate at the right time for the right situations. Um, in terms of digestate, yes, of course, digestate can be a very useful biofertilizer put on the, at the right rate, but also farmers need to consider how it is applied to reduce fugitive ammonia emissions and also odor emissions there can be a lot of volatilization of the of ammonia if it's not put on in the right way and applied to soils in the right way which basically means a lot of that nitrogen that's been recycled is lost to the atmosphere where it can cause problems so i think it's all about using the right quantities at the right time in the right place and understanding the soils on which it's going to go thank you very much Thank you very much, Jane. I would like to ask Marco now. You know, we have, as you saw at the beginning of the webinar, we have we have a very diverse set of participants today, uh, from all across the globe, from low and middle income countries. So, what kind of recommendations could you give those? Should they be looking for centralized or decentralized setups for both compost plants or you know AD plants? What is your recommendation? Oh. It I would say it, the recommendation cannot be linked to the income of a country, much more on the situation you're working on, the morphology of the country and where mm -hmm. you are. Generally speaking, 
I think Apache suggestion came already from Jane before. Uh, some technologies are cheaper or are less mm. uh, capital intensive than others. So normally composting is cheaper to realize compared to investment needed for anaerobic digestion. By the way, that's why, at least in Europe, AD facilities from waste have been subsidized by some kinds of subsidies from the energy which has been produced at these facilities. Uh, very generally speaking, I would say that, of course, you need centralized larger facilities when you're working in urban or high density areas. As soon as you get into smaller communities, you get more decentralized, more rural areas of where transport costs would affect uh, transporting waste to a centralized facility or transporting compost back to to the users to the fields so the agricultural sector well in that case uh, decentralized facilities are preferable it's not so easy to say we have a very practical example from europe that you can spot in our report number one if you mm -hmm. compare the average number of inhabitants per composting or biogas facility that you can find in uk or in italy which has almost the same population. And, and this number is roughly 100,000, 120,000 inhabitants per facility. When then you move to Switzerland, which is a mm -hmm. high income country like, uh, like Europe and UK are, and in that case, the number is 20,000. So mm. why are there much more facilities there? For the reason that the larger number of facilities has to take into consideration the complexity of the territory where you're working at. So that's why it's not it's Absolutely. not really linked to income, but to the local circumstances, at Absolutely. least in my opinion. Thank you very much for clarifying that. Um, just coming up to a last point that, you know, these are questions that came in before. Uh, to Jane this time, do renewable fertilizers have to meet specific quality criteria, maybe giving examples from the EU, uh, what kind of directives exist or regulations? Yeah, thanks, Aditi. I think it's very much up to the individual countries to define that. Um, we've recently had the EU fertilizers regulation um, adopted in uh, Europe, which will set criteria if member states choose to trade their compost and digest data across borders. Um, in the UK, we have what's called PASS 100. PAS 110, which sets quality criteria, and that's linked with end of waste criteria. But of course, there are other drivers as well in terms of quality and standards, which include a lot of the supermarkets, the quality assurance schemes that um, their producers who are producing vegetables and, um, and grazing livestock on um, that, that will have to buy into. So yes, there are standards. The European Compost Network as well has developed some standards for anaerobic digest state as well, um, lim with limits for um, contaminants such as heavy metals and, and, and the like. Um, I did see mm -hmm. um, one of our ISWA colleagues, Christophe Cotton in France, um, putting a mm -hmm. comment up about um, Con, um, about um, just scrolling down to it about pollutants, mm -hmm. even with regard to the French standard. And okay. I think it's important to stress what Marco's stressed as well that quality control has to be right from the very beginning with good communications to the householders, to the people who are the sources of the organic wastes, yeah. putting in place proper collection schemes with good information, good publicity and ongoing publicity right through to the, the plants themselves. And I think there's an awful lot more research that we could be doing to help reduce, especially with regard to physical contaminants in um, materials, plastics being, you know, being, being burdened yeah. around the world. So um, no silver bullet there, Christoph, but um, I think working away at those quality control points right the way through that supply issue is, has got to be the, the way forward. Um, so yes, quality is absolutely important, especially considering long-term um, benefits um, and long-term applications to soil. Thank you very much, Jane. Both of you stressed the quality issue and we need to really drive that home that you have to start with quality right at the beginning of the process. Um, lots of questions have actually come in from the chat box and we have very few minutes left now for the webinar actually. So we will come up with a way to actually get all these questions together and have answers, but I'm just going to go over them very, very quickly. 
uh, with the names. Um, some of them have already been answered by Marco um, on the chat box itself, but I will just read them out for you, both Jane and Marco. Uh, so it comes from Joseph Wang. This is just in the order the questions have come in and some have been answered already. So he asks, how to secure long-term buyers for compost? Uh, he, he's seen in Denmark and Taiwan that compost is just being given away. So, it, you know, is it, it's difficult to access finance if there's no offtake of these kind of uh, products. So, and also the second question that he puts there within the same question is that, is it not illegal to use compost from municipal solid waste for agriculture? Now, you have answered a bit of it from your, your presentation and also from the other answers, but I'd like to give you the floor, Marco, now uh, to answer. Well, uh, regarding Joseph's question, I actually tried to answer during Jane speak his second question. But okay. just let me stress this fact. The, the aim of these four reports produced by our working group are exactly these. We know that the market for compost and even for digestate, just for digestate, is low. Uh, even in advanced countries, if by advanced we consider countries which have a very developed system for managing municipal solid waste. And that's exactly the point. Uh, decision makers, local decision makers and even waste managers very often oversee the benefits of bringing back quality organics into soil. And if you oversee the benefits, you don't give any economic value to that. That's why the aspect of economic value will be shown in what we call report number four. So our, our summer webinar in August when you're part of you are probably enjoying your summer holidays. But that's exactly the point. We would like to point your attention on that. We know that very often there, there's not a significant market for quality compost, even for quality compost. And uh, I would say that it is the same if you ask any local authority, would they give money or invest? If you would have asked them 10 years ago, would you invest in preventing marine littering? in terms mm -hmm. of plastic littering, they were probably unaware about the issue and had no, we hope at least, readable, re, re, uh, easy readable and understandable documents where you don't need to be a soil expert to grasp the main uh, aspects. Uh, so our wish is that uh, with this uh, study, uh, really decision makers have become more aware that you need also to finance the agricultural sector which can play a role in restoring soil fertility and this has long-term effects 10 20 years yeah. which can be monetized stop absolutely that's why thank i didn't so answer much. that question in britain it was too long but thank you for thank you very much so we have had very interesting questions come in lots of good comments as well but we can't go into tremendous detail in this webinar. It's because of time constraints. We keep it to an hour because people can't take out more than that during their work days. Uh, we will try and find a way to have this kind of an interactive document available for everybody. Um, we are still thinking about how to go about it. But I would just like to give the floor back for just conclusions, brief conclusions. And um, maybe start with you, Jane. What kind of take home message would you like the participants to take from this webinar? And yeah, just your two, two cents, two, two lines. <clears throat> two, two lines, organic materials, quality, low contaminant organic materials onto soil can have very significant soil benefits. Hmm. The benefits of anaerobic digestate are generally short term and more focused around their nutrient content. The benefits of compost are medium to longer term, focused around their organic carbon content. Perfect. That was the sin. Okay. Uh, Marco, over to Short and sweet. Circular economy involving organic waste management and having a look at sustainable soil strategy needs mm -hmm. to involve cities. Cities, okay. we are becoming a global population living in cities. And so cities, city managers, city decision makers have to take now, uh, be, become conscious about the, their role they can play. So we encourage them to act proactively to sort organics and to send it to quality composting and quality anaerobic digestion. Thank you very much. Short and sweet as well. Um, just want to let everybody know, all the participants, that our next webinar is going to happen in July. And this is a series of four webinars because of the four reports that we've worked on. So do join us for the others. These are going to be recorded. So if you ever miss one, you can go back and watch it on YouTube. 
Um, there's several questions have come in. I'm sorry we don't have more than just an hour to spend with you, but we'd like to say a big thank you to the speakers and for you, uh, to you for joining us uh, at this webinar. And we would like to see you again. But for now, thank you and goodbye. Very. Take care, be safe, and see you at the next webinar. Thank you very much. Take care. See you in July. Yeah, stay safe, guys. Keep composting. <laughs> <laughs> Keep composting. Take care. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>